Hey everybody, um, this is another episode of live contract reviews and today we actually get a review from an external contributor and let's jump to a contract. Okay. Um, so it's called near stake token and I haven't looked at the code or in any detail. So it would be fun to do this live together. Um, the idea is to introduce a token that is backed by staked near tokens. And then you can just uh, transfer it and trade it. And I assume it will uh, supposed to receive a reward similar to how compound wrap tokens appreciate in price and later can be redeemed back to the original asset. Except uh, in this case, asset is near and um, or stake near and then it collects uh, more rewards. Okay, so stake is back to near token and stake earnings, makes sense. Um, deposit near, specify staking pool to delegate. In exchange, the customer receives the stake token. Storage fees, any applicable storage fees are deducted from deposit. This is kind of cool. Um, and then they are refunded when you withdraw. Right, so stake token value is total stake near balance divided by total stake token supply. Um, hmm. That actually depends if all of the stake tokens are staked to the same pool. If not, then it might be an issue because different pool may have different rewards. And let's say you deposit somewhere to 100% reward pool, then while you appreciate from other people reward, you can also keep all the rewards if you own the pool. And stake near not available, yes, this is a problem. Um, if another is submitted, then everything is locked, All right? Um, so yeah, the problem is because staking pool relocks everything after another unstaking action, then if multiple people through this contract stake into the same pool, then they will need to either wait for on staking to happen until they can send another one for four epochs or they will uh, break the withdrawal for the previous person. So that's not easy. Um, the work around on staking request will be held until a previous on staking request is complete. That works. Yeah, that's fine. Usually you don't need to unstake uh, because you already have a staking token which you can trade and like exchange for near somewhere else potentially. Quick quick question. Um, I remember looking at some of the core contracts and we had like an enum that was like the status was idle or like a transaction was like idle or busy basically. Mm -hmm. Is there something similar with staking where you have like a, a status associated with it, where it's like withdraw in progress, in process of withdrawing or whatever, or does that not exist? So I think it was um, for duration of the transaction. So it was like, if you, it's for a lockup contract. If you issue a transaction from a lockup contract, then, um, 
we prevent you from issuing any other transaction from the lockup contract until this one completes. And that's done through this, you know, kind of locking the state of the lockup. Um, except like in some rare cases. Um, cool, Let, let's jump into the contract. So starting with Leap and um, so there are a bunch of modules, um, import and global allocator. Oh, well, let's start with Tamil. So it uses nearest decay two and some interesting uh, dependencies. So primitive types allows to use like uint and stuff um, and deflate, I don't know what is the deflate create. Isn't that like yeah, gzip, like, like compression? Zlib. Yeah, zlib or gzip or something. Um, not sure. Can I go there? Yeah. Yeah. Deflate bytes. That's interesting. So like to compress data, you basically exchange in storage, which is more expensive towards um, towards the compute, but at the same time, contract is more, is larger. So you pay in for the like dictionary, common dictionary I deflate once. So if I try to build it, there's a, um, was on storage to unknown unknown. I wonder how large the contract is. It has a Rust flags in in cargo, so that should be fine by building it without passing the Rust flag for optimization. All right, let's continue for now. Um, okay, so this is the main structure. It has a operator ID. So some kind of admin role configuration config updated on block index. Um, okay. Yeah, the block timestamp is not needed so long as you have block type accounts and um, staking tools and order it set. Hey, Chad. Hi, sorry, I'm late. Yeah, so we are reviewing uh, new contract that allows you to stake, uh, to convert your delegated tokens into a wrapped fungible token. And that is provided by our community member, Oyster Buck. Okay, um, failed use of and declared module. Your blockchain. Um, where? I don't see this. Mm, doesn't need nightly. It doesn't need nightly. Yeah, that's weird. Um, so I'm gonna do quick search in a project. 
and I cannot find near blockchain. I think I maybe did something wrong. Maybe the target. No, target is correct. Um, not sure. Maybe I should have tried to build it. Okay. Let's see if there is tests and I can try to run tests locally instead. So C line allows to run tests. And let's see if it compiles. So default is banned, state is already initialized. So you take operator ID and the config. So you either pass a config or not. And the cool part about this is if you're, because we use JSON, then if you pass config, then it will be just present in a JSON. But if you just ignore it completely, this argument, then it's still going to be valid. So you can just pass operator D an account. Yeah, so it does compile locally, just for some reason didn't compile for me um, when I did cargo build. Please release. Right. Yeah, so not sure why it didn't compile and complained about um, wasn target. Maybe I don't have wasn target for this target. Okay, there we go. No. Near binding cannot be found. That's super weird. Um, because it's imported here. Okay, let's see on the left. Yeah, I'm getting the same error here. What's the file size? It also doesn't tell you. Uh, 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 it doesn't tell you which file it doesn't compile. Oh, account. Okay, let's see account. Maybe it's just not imported in account. No. Um, okay. Let's try to move all imports up. And um, it shouldn't affect anything. Unused imports, unused variables. That, uh, that doesn't affect anything. Yeah. Near blockchain. From maybe near SDK is broken for some reason or something like this. Because some dependency was published. Let's see if I can still compile something. Um, okay, while I'm checking, let's continue this. All right, so to be initialize operator with check operator ID, it basically verifies that operator is not a current contract and 
it's a valid operator, oh, it's valid account. Cool. Um, so config is either default or it can be passed updated on index. So we basically just record the current index. Accounts is default, which is a lookup map with a prefix um, zero. Cool, that works. And no accounts. It, um, and we have an order set of staking pools, which we use date ID uh, two. So this is a different way of doing prefixes, but it's kind of cool as well. It um, allows you to just have one module. So from Rust like thing, it is um, it basically just means a slice of size one of U8, and this is a zero. So it's pretty much the same that you can write as something like this. I'm pretty sure you can do um, something like this. Um, but this is gonna, but this gives you not a reference, even so both of them gonna be static. So one way of doing this is kind of like this, but it's, um, this is fine too. Okay, so all of this is initialized. They all, um, they all unique. So all prefixes are unique. So then it writes states So this is not needed because you're gonna use init and it just can be rewritten like this. So you just return it and it will write it at the end of the new because of the init. Um, okay, so just the two getters that return operator ID and a block index into you. Do you need the state, right? I remember. No, no it, it will just happen. It will happen automatically after init completes. So this is not needed. Because of the init decorator, right? Right. So it just writes to state whatever you returned. Yep. Um, so this is not decorated with near bunch, uh, which means these methods are not going to be exposed. Plus, they, they have a private visibility, which is also going to be. So I'm going to remove cargo lock and try to rebuild to see if a lock file used something different from what I expect. But it's strange. Um, so this, yeah, this is a check that verifies that we saw. And this check asserts that the, oopsie, that operator, that the caller is operator ID. Then we have tests, a unit test that uh, initializes a contract verifies the default config block index that was passed from the context and checks it through the view call. Then this cast passes a custom config, verifies that um, that the operator is different so this test actually can be also rewritten in more uh, precise way. So for now, you can see that the test is decorated with should panic. It means the test should throw panic at the at some point of the execution. 
but you can also add a message that should match uh, what panic it is. So I'm compiling this test right now. Because I deleted log file, it has to rebuild everything. And my terminal still compiles it as well. So I guess my CPU is pretty slow. Um, so this just passes in valid account ID. And as you can see, there's some module from test mode that gives um, helpers. Let's take a look. Your account ID is just casted to account using um, a string. Okay, so test completed. And it basically said panicked because left not equal right. So you can see this helper message that we can assert here. I don't remember the syntax, something like expected, like this. So you can mark a module or a test with a specific message. And then when you rewrite the test, it will verify that the panic contains this message. So now if I modified something like, oh no, then it should fail because the panic is different. So the panic was like, hey, operator ID must be, um, where's my, oh no. Uh, I guess this is the assert message. So it doesn't match the one that we put here. That's why the test failed. So if, for example, something failed at initialization that is different, then uh, then the test will not complete. Similar how if for invalid account ID, if you put it there, then it's an operator ID is not a valid account ID. So we can just paste this message here, if this is what we expect. And then when I rewrite it, it completes. So this unit test make it more precise because they verify something. Otherwise, um, it can be a nasty bug with something like I can panic here. Oh no. And it never gets to the actual panic. So it still completes and succeeds while we never verified it. But if we would put it here, then uh, the test would fail. So this is uh, a good way of making sure that the test actually verifies the panic you want. There was another way of how you can do this. You can basically catch a panic using the custom panic handler and later work something with this panic. Or like you can ignore it and continue. So if you want to check multiple panics on the way, What's that syntax look like? I haven't seen that. Uh, we had it in really old unit tests. You basically put something like std custom panic handler. You pass the closure that just puts the panic into some variable and returns it instead of unwrapping it and then returns you back to the execution. Then you restore the panic handler and continue the process. And you can parse the panic using a sort. It cool. should be in a Rust book somewhere in the like a uh, helper. Okay, empty operator is also just not a valid account ID. And this is also not a valid account ID. And finally, multiple initializations. Um, so that's interesting because this piece is actually panics. Um, this contract already initialized, which is actually correct. Um, but unit tests are not really a good way of testing it because the state is somewhat weird. 
without, for example, this right, so without this sync, this test will not panic. It's because unit tests do not really store into the state. Um, it just calls this method. So that may be why this piece is here. But if you do a simulation test, then this uh, method would fail. OK, um, let's go to some other place, I think, stake. Um, stake or account. Account is, has some logic, so this is good. I'm just quickly scroll through this and stake. Also has some logic. Uh, let's start with stake RS. So let's see if terminal was able to build. No, still fails for some reason. Maybe I'm used the older contract. Um, all right, so stake token service. Is what we reviewed, staking service. So trade is like an interface. Let's read the comment. So so contract enable stake owner to earn reward while be able to trade. Yes. Contract rules. Customer can deposit and stake near and exchange for stake tokens. Stake tokens are issued for near tokens that are delegated to staking pools. Staking near means stake. Stake tokens implements the allowance free vault based token standard. So this is kind of cool. Um, except, um, yeah, it uses saves probably and we should update it to vault, but it's saying vault. So it depends on the interface. Um, stake tokens can be redeemed for near, which triggers near to be unstaked. Amount of near to unstake for the next scheduled and staking transaction. Storage fees are paid by the customer. So this pretty cool contract is like a lot of uh, concepts around both storage fees that are charged to the user as well as um, on staking that is delayed. So it's a lot of logic that it's supposed to do. So yeah, global storage fees are paid by this contract. Okay, staking service. So first method called deposit and stake. Um, so it stakes the attached deposit to the specific staking pool, returns a promise. Uh, if there's any storage fees, then they will be deducted from the deposit. Um, so what it does is check staking pool Account ID, panics if the account is, ID is not valid, right? Deposit attached. Uh, date customer account, check if customer account fees needs to be applied. So removes that. Deposit and stake with the staking pool. Updates total balance stake with staking pool. Computes stake token value in here. Okay, credit account with stake tokens, logs the event. 
Okay. All right, let's look at the method and its implementation. Okay, if it's there. I see. So it's possible that not all of these methods are implemented and not, not all of the logic is completed yet. Uh, and that's why maybe it doesn't compile, but because it's not fully completed. Uh, let's see, it's taking. Oh, okay, it's here. No. Okay, yeah. So I guess not, the contract is not fully complete. Um, and I was asked to look at the account. So let's look at the account for now. All right, so when a new account is registered, it's assigned to the next sequence value, sure. Uh, remove account. Computes a hash. So hash is 32 bytes. And it basically just hashes this value into a fixed size. Fixed size is cool because um, when you do borsh serialize on top of the hash, it uh, doesn't put the length of the value. So it only takes like 32 bytes. If you would put a vector there, then it would put um, 36 bytes. So it removes if there was already an account, then it decreases the count and returns this account. Uh, default, we talked about default. Okay, so account has the following. It has a storage escrow in a balance. Stake balances. So stake token is different for every stake and pool. Okay. And available near balance. So this is probably the balance that is already withdrawn and available to either deposit or, or withdraw. So it looks like it does. Early on, you were wondering if people had multiple staking pools, but it looks like that's taken yeah. into account here. Yeah, it basically does a stake token for every pool. Cool. So you can essentially stake with multiple pools. I would probably rewrite it where you have a one contract per staking pool. So if you have a staking pool, then maybe there's a factory that deploys a contract that only works with one staking pool. It has a bunch of benefits. One of them is um, you just have a single token to worry about and a single balance to worry about. It makes it work nicer with sharding because let's say you have two different accounts that trade heavily. They don't have to go through one contract they can be done in parallel considering there can be multiple shards. A downside of this is you will have to deploy multiple contracts and currently it's expensive because our contracts is fairly large after compilation. Um, this can be addressed with two ways. Uh, one of them is we will eventually have replicatable contracts, which means the code is deployed once and paid once and everybody just has a link to the code, basically just a hash of the contract code. Um, hmm. So that so wouldn't be, be, that wouldn't be using cross contract calls. That would be like, actually, yeah. Could, could you explain that a little bit more? Right, so we have a map for this uh, that explains this. So the technical side we can ignore for now, the way it works, you, deploy a contract code 
to a specific account. So similar how EVM is a custom account, there are going to be like a global contracts registry or something like this, or library. You call deploy code on this account, um, and you have to transfer balance for this entire deployment to this account. So it takes your balance if the contract doesn't exist, and it puts it into a code base where every shard has access to. Now, when you have a, an account, then there may be a new way of deploying a code, such as deploy by hash, or if you already deployed the code before, the same code, then the next time you touch this account, it will release the storage under this contract and credit it back to you. So it will delete the local copy of this contract code from your account and just use the remote one because every shard has access to this and they will be indexed by hash. So, or you can I could imagine by hash. Yeah, I could imagine we might be able to generalize that so that if the same contract gets deployed to a different account, mm -hmm. the chain can say like, oh, this is already over on this account in this shard. And then the shard right. where this account lives knows that it needs to like store it and it, store it locally in its own database, whoever is running this shard. So um, yeah, that, that way you need like to be able to address like when you delete a code on one account, you need to charge or like keep the, the, yeah, charge I the see. other account. And then when you rebalance or like reshuffle accounts, yeah, reshard them. Okay. Okay, let's continue. Um, so this is, well, you were oh. saying there were two ways. That was one way that we could make it cheaper to deploy multiple to do a factory pattern. What's the second way? Second way is uh, no STD. So there's some work to make contracts smaller. It will not make it completely cheap, but it will definitely make it like maybe take six to eight times cheaper comparing to STD version. That's a lot. So STD contains a lot of debugging information, um, collections like hash map and stuff like this. Um, Noise TD, first of all, we'll need different JSON work that works with Noise TD. Even Sustard also works. Uh, then Borsch, Noise TD, and then, yeah, Noise TD just like much smaller comparing to STD um, binaries. Plus, we can strip all, a lot of debugging info out then it will also make it. Okay, so trade account registry. So it has a register account. So I assume it works similarly how you do um, uh, vault based fungible token. So you have one kind of registration endpoint because it's fixed size per account. Then you have a register account and number of accounts registered. So account registered is a, um, because it implements trade. Uh, this is doesn't need to be public. So all trade methods are considered public by default. And near Bungeon actually works fine with this. We verified that. So account registered, this is the view call in a Rustish way. The Rust doesn't have gets, it usually just um, has the getter. Accounts, dot accounts. So self here is a token registry. Accounts is a lookup map and contains key hash of this. Remind me what accounts, why accounts.accounts is needed. Uh, so one of them is from a contract structure that just has a accounts sub structure here. 
So instead of a map, and this account also has a number of accounts. So just Thanks. Okay. So it just verified if account already exists. Um, register account. Oh, that's interesting. So it's a. Uh, that's it functions, huh? Yeah. Uh, check our. Is that common? No, not really. What's it do? I'm aware, I'm familiar with the implications uh, of it it functions just, in JavaScript, it, but not in REST. It has a context of the local local function. So okay. It has so access to mute cell. It's a closure. Kind of like a closure. Um, except there's like different types of closures in REST. Like once, mutable, and like um, reusable closures. It doesn't look like it's being used here. No, the it's reference just to self. a bunch of declarations first. I assume it's used below here, right? So check args. It will basically validate arguments. So deposit is positive. Um, account is not a current account. Uh, that probably doesn't need to be tested because the current account should not have keys eventually. So that cannot really happen. And it just returns account and deposit. But it also doesn't, yeah, that's fine. Uh, second method is called apply storage fees. It, it's kind of interesting because you can move this out of this uh, method. They, it doesn't use any local context. So you can reuse it for someone else, some other method if you want to. But if you're not using it anywhere else, it's kind of a nice way to create sure. a clear mental model of what this function does. Right. Okay, apply storage fees. It takes self. This is kind of self. Um, so capital letter self is uh, just an alias for the current structure. Initial storage. So this is similar. So this is a method from fungible token, original fungible token that refunds these. Um, it basically takes a current storage after modification and you pass initial storage. Then you calculate the difference whether you allocated more storage or least storage. And then it takes the attached deposit and it return, refunds you the difference from what you attached and to what's uh, required deposit. And uh, it would panic here if you didn't attach enough and tries to increase storage more. But it also returns um, how much it needed for storage. Can I go back one second and like, what's the what's the difference between lowercase self and capital S self exactly? So lowercase is an instance and capital is a class. Okay. Banger. It also, this method assumes that the storage has increased or at least didn't decrease because it does this check here which is both of them are U128 or U64. So it would panic if, if it underflows. Okay, so next we get a hash for the account. We check if the account is already registered, then it returns a result um, already registered or registered and here's the fee. 
Cool. Um, I guess this is fine. Another way of doing this would be some kind of Rust way of doing this. It would be result using actual std result, something like result um, p or uh, registration error. And then the registration error. So in this case, you can potentially return error, registration error already registered. Um, and in case of success, you would return okay, storage fee, for example. Or if you want to be explicit, then you can do storage fee. Something like this, or registration access of registration. So basically, you can separate whether it's success or failure. So I guess in this case, it's kind of success, but the problem you just consume the deposits. So if I would attach balance here to registration and my account already exists, then this method just uh, took my money because it returned okay. So correct way of this is gonna be, is better to like panic here, say like, hey, already registered. In this so, case, it would not take the attached deposit. Um, here. Okay, I, I guess I didn't know that. So, so panic. You, so you, don't, you don't have to do extra work to refund when right. someone attaches a, a deposit. Yeah, yeah. Panic pretty much gonna revert entire transaction. So if you did anything before, or well, not transaction, entire receipt. So if there was like. For example, you can deploy a contract, then do something else, and then do function call for initialization, and then function call fails, entire thing gonna deploy from creation of account to deployment to access keys to to attach deposit and stuff like this, and transfer. Even though it might have spanned several blocks, or if you do it like no, that, no, it's only all for one, one block that is batched actions. Okay. Um, account needs to pay for its storage so we get the storage we create the default account we insert the account by hash we increment the account um, a storage fee um, contains so we discussed this with chat in some other contract about the way of doing this um, and like if you want to optimize a few a few gas pieces you can do the following so we don't really need to check that the account is um, does not exist what we can do we can insert um, insert and verify that it doesn't has the doesn't have a previous value so then we can panic here but it requires you to panic actually because if you are not going to panic then it actually going to insert the new value and return so what this happens is we basically try to insert and if there is already a previous value exist for this hash, then we panic and it's all gonna roll it back. So you don't need to verify. Plus you I find it funny. a little uh I still find it a bit surprising. I don't love that right, pattern. But, but this we do two serialization of the keys and two lookups pretty much. So you pay right. fees twice. If you do this like 
million times, not million times, but like hundred times, then it totally would make sense to optimize this as much as possible. For this pattern is totally fine as well. So long as you refund. Um, Are you just saying, Chad, that you don't like the, the syntax of like, if blah, blah, blah is some, it's like, no, no. I don't like Should the, it? I don't like yeah. the kind of like uh, uh, elite mode version that Eugene does just in terms of like expressivity, <laughs> I find it surprising, right? Like when I read that, I don't, uh, I it, it takes some like insider knowledge to it also, understand it also, what the code is doing. It also assumes that it will be rewarded. So like it assumes it will be exactly. in this place because the insert already happened, but you may don't want to do the insert, so you rely on panic to revert the state, and this is what's confusing. Well, this one is cleaner in terms of like, well, we didn't modify the state up to this point, so here we are ready to modify the state. Perhaps okay. just like elite mode stuff just needs a comment above it to you know, make it read better. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess there's still the like possibility in the future, perhaps, that the behavior of how things are reverted, right? You're like relying on implementation details of the blockchain itself versus like writing code that uh, this is like, somewhat would work even if it were changed. To here, right? We actually do explicit assert, and like often we do if this then panics because. We can just ignore this piece, and uh, this line will overflow and panic. So that would be fine as well. Right. So we, we do some of a bit of error message. Yeah. OK, so storage fee, uh, we refund it. Now we say we store this, because this is a new account. Um, we have to reinsert it because we first need to record how much the account cost. Uh, that actually can be avoided if we do this once when we calculate how much account cost. Uh, in Rust, well, you you also have a key, so this makes it a little challenge, and you need to know inner working of the blockchain and it might change right if the fees are changed change then so that's some work the unnecessary work that we have to reinsert the account after modifying the storage of crap um anyway so and then we return the result that it was inserted um, boom. Okay, so it doesn't include deposit of the balance, it just takes the, stores the balance that it was paid. And what's interesting also here is um, if in the future config changes, then you do not rely on the actual storage that being used by the account, but instead have this explicitly given here. So if the storage becomes cheaper, you do not start to refund a cheaper price, but you will keep refunding at the correct price when you, I assume, on a register account. So it's 11. I missed how they're calculating the storage fees. Can we look at that briefly? Like uh, yes. where they're saying uh, apply okay. storage fees. Yeah, so you basically take the difference between. Oh, it's passed in in the config when you initialize the contract. Yeah. yeah. Storage yeah, pressure by, the, okay. Also default, which is kind of my net fee for one byte. Right. From, I was uh, wondering, from, like, at some point we might add the ability to look up configs like mm -hmm. that yep. from the environment. Mm -hmm. So on the register account, um, so if it's not registered, then 
we just return it. And this is a Rusty match. So it's a final match. So it, the value of this result will be returned from the method. And if it was registered, then if the account is not empty, um, oh, it's an ordered map. Yeah, this is the issue uh, where, because there's multiple accounts, they may have a conflict on their balances because every map needs to be within its own subsuffix. Right now, they all reuse the same map. So unless, um, unless we store them separately, so yeah, it's probably a bug. So the bug mm. here is because if you created two accounts, they will reuse the same map and they will have conflicts in their balances because the key gonna be the same because this is just a prefix. So the way to address this is to pass a cache. So remove default to something like Intel account, make it new, and then take a hash, and then you do something like concat hash. Um, Cash and state ID. Probably the other way around, but yeah. Sure. Yeah. One way or another. another. I think this way is somewhat fine too. Maybe, yeah. Doesn't matter. Because the length is going to be unique. Uh, so what it does, it basically concatenates the unique hash of the account with the key. Um, and then it creates a key of 32 or 33 bytes that will be unique for every account instance based on their account ID. So your balances are not going to intersect. And this is the same pattern we saw in the fungible token example, I believe, right? Okay, so it verifies that you don't have any balances, then um, it is safe to transfer a sync. That's fine because you will delete this record here. Um, again, the pattern that I would use is use remove instead of get. <laughs> Um, and I, then I don't need to do remove here because if nothing is removed, that's fine. If something is removed, this is fine. And then I would have to panic here. But if you want to return not a panic, but actual value, then you cannot rely on a contract being panicked because we don't really have a revert and a return. Um, cool. And um, yeah, it returns you how much money it refunded here. I think like if I can give like a general comment about this whole project, this is like extremely interesting. Like besides the like in-depth rust here, like just the idea of tokenizing staked near is really cool and I, f I feel like there is like a eureka moment that i haven't fully had yet but people are tokenizing multiple different things just in blockchain and um i like kind of get it and i think it's just so awesome that someone from the community did this um and we're seeing this in like you know basic attention token is like tokenizing attention um and there's this one site, I think it's called gastoken.io, where people are like, like tokenizing, like fluctuating gas prices. And I totally don't get that yet. But this is another one of those examples. And um, yeah, I just want to applaud this this person for implementing it. OK, uh, I need to reverse some stuff around account logic. If you want to test 
checklist. Okay. So there is an interesting test about um, registering new account. Um, so what it does, it basically saying we're gonna attach them near, uh, but at the initialization, um, so this succeeds, um, but in theory, you should not reuse the same context and instead clone it because context can be modified and then you you don't really need a deposit at start because you're just initializing the contract. So it should fail. Okay, I didn't pay for the fees. So before doing this, you would say something like, hey, then Yokta. Now these two methods are view calls. So you may wanna do change context to view. Use view true. So this is a macro that uh, takes a context and initialize the blockchain and passes the storage back. Right, I need to change view back to not view. Okay, it works. So it just allows you to also verify that you don't require balances in some places. Um, it's unclear why this didn't panic. It is attached deposit. It seems like in near SDK, we don't verify that the constructor doesn't take payable. Which is probably okay, because constructor usually only called once. Um, then you call register account and you expect that it's gonna be registered and not, if it's already registered, then it's a panic. Then we again need to switch to a view call without deposit. Um, and rerun it. So it works. The register pre existing account. Um, so you can see that there's uh, already a bug that we spotted before. So it's just not verified there because context is simply reused. Um, so if we move it here, again, switch to clone. Um, and we will original balance. Um, we basically take the original balance after this initialization happened and we call match registered. So we registered the account. So account balance should be increased by Account balance should be equal original balance plus a storage fee. So this is how we can verify that the contract only took uh, required amount of storage. What else we can verify is we can do um, storage usage. We can say here is original storage usage, and we can verify that the something like storage usage 
increased as well by storage fee divided by config uh, default. What's the name of this config? Um, storage per byte. Cool. Okay, let's try to rerun. Uh, what is the octa near? Oh, right. That's true. Zero. Expected 64. So let's cast it to 64. What did the point zero do? Uh, it returns a JSON. And I just take an inner, inner value. So it's similar how to write um, storage fee balance. That's like storage fee into All right, we'll cast it to balance. Then we can remove this to, to the storage fee balance. So generally, Chad, like capital U128. If you have one of those, you can do dot zero, and it'll give you lowercase u128. Wow, what a trick. Uh, it basically, the way this internally, uh, well, that's not super easy. It is a structure yeah. that has a tuple inside, so unnamed structure. And, uh, and it has two. You want, uh, yeah, whatever. It doesn't matter. We don't need to get okay. into that. So, I just didn't know so that trick. Next, what happens next is um, we have to do this again. And okay, we, we check the balance again. We already have it. So, original balance is account balance. And um, storage usage is this. Attached deposit, we attach the tokens again. But also we need to say account balance is account balance and context storage uses storage. Use. So we just need to update store context as well because now we call it again. Uh, now we call it, oops, it's still uh, where it failed. Well, while you're thinking about that, like, I, I feel like these kind of tests would be better in simulations instead of like constantly changing the context. Right, because, yeah, because you have to. Uh, well, weird. Um, so for some reason, oh, uh, no. Yeah, the problem is I didn't change the context. Yeah, that that's much better in simulation, and it would actually cut the bug that we don't refund the storage or ref don't refund the money uh, and just keep it. So, so we're out of time, and let's finish it quickly. Okay, so it still works, but now what should happen is this is expected behavior but if you would verify this stuff so what we expect is um, we expect that the account balance uh, doesn't change and we expect the storage usage that didn't change so if we verify the storage usage it works but um, when we verified that the balance didn't change, it fails. So it means that we took the tokens in. Um, okay, so we're out of time, uh, but that was very interesting contract. I like the idea of it and like overall the implementation is super nice. So 
we definitely should come back to this later once there is more to the contract added. And that's uh, great. Thanks for everyone who attended. And thanks for Oyster Pack for this contract and allowing us to review it live. Have a good day. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Bye.